<laughs> well, God bless you all. Thank you for being here on this wonderful Sunday morning. The Sunday in, here in the United States is before Thanksgiving, and there's a lot to be thankful for. <laughs> uh, I'm going to try to make it through this teaching without crying, but I don't know if I'll make it. You know, I've, I've been preparing for this teaching for over a month now, and the the I haven't learned a lot of new things about communion, but I've seen and felt a lot of new depth. The sacrifice of Christ is so incredible and so meaningful. And frankly, for some of us so so undeserved that it the only thing we could possibly do in return is just give our best, absolutely give our best for the Lord Jesus Christ. The communion service is not as well understood as it should be, and there's a lot of reasons for that. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. But I want to talk about the history also of communion, because one of the things that we need to be aware of is that when communion started, when Christ did communion, if you will, with his apostles in that guest room on the, you know, the, the week of, that he was crucified, um, it it wasn't uh, it wasn't a ceremony. The disciples had no idea it was coming. I'm sure Christ knew and planned for it, but there wasn't special bread. It was just the ordinary bread they were eating. There wasn't special wine. It was just the ordinary wine they were drinking, and there wasn't a special chalice to serve it out of. It was just the ordinary cup that they were drinking from. And generally speaking, you know, one of the things I've, I've come from a family of big hikers, and one of the things you learn from nature is when it comes to things that hold water, nature is very stingy. You know, there's there's a lot of things that poke, like, you know, you can find a stick and make a spear and that kind of thing. But but trying to find something that holds water is, is very difficult. And so cups had to be made. And because of that, cups were, in a lot of cultures, cups were very expensive. In fact, our English word cupboard comes from the word cup board, because many homes only had, especially in like uh, uh, the very beginnings of the United States, when people lived in the log cabins with dirt floors, they weren't very wealthy. Uh, very, very often a family would just have one or two cups. It wouldn't be like in today where you open a cabinet and there's a zillion cups there just one or two cups. And so it was very common in the dining room that you had a board and the cup was on it. And it was the cup board. <laughs> that's, that's actually what it was called. And it held the cup. And then if somebody was thirsty during the meal, they'd say, hey, hey, reach out there and get the cup for me. And the person took it from the cup board and then put it uh, back when it was be after it was being used. And that happened at the Last Supper. We'll see as we re read the three Gospels that talk about the, the Lord's Supper at the Last Supper, that they actually passed the cup around among themselves. It's not like anybody went around with a pitcher of wine and poured each person their own individual cup full. It was one cup, and they passed it around. And so the, 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 the start, the organic start of the Last Supper was simply a meal. And that's one of the things that I love about doing this before Thanksgiving, because we're going to be getting together with families. We're going to have a Thanksgiving meal. Somebody should remember the blood and the broken body at that meal and say something about it, because that's when we're supposed to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Well, then what happened was, as you know, it, in the Roman world, it was difficult for people to get together. Some of them were slaves and they weren't free. So they had to walk everywhere. Some of them didn't have a lot of time. And so as a result, uh, get togethers became very deliberate. And so, and of course, generally speaking, in Christianity anyway, it morphed to being on Sundays. And so we see, for example, in Acts chapter two, that when the people did get together, then they celebrated the Lord's Supper, and it was called that. It was called the Lord's Supper, and we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17, where it was early on, it was actually called the Lord's Supper. And we see the celebration of that in verses like Acts chapter 2, when they all get together and they ate together. Then the, the Lord's Supper began to, to morph into a little more of a ceremony. 
than just having a meal together and remembering the body and blood of Christ. So by the time we get to Jude chapter 1 in verse 12, we read those talking about ungodly people who are hidden reefs at your love feasts. And so the name morphed from the Lord's Supper to love feasts. And that's one of the things we see about communion through the ages is the name changes and it goes back and forth. And so now we call it again, the Lord's Supper. We don't call it a love feast anymore. And then eventually through through history, just as a matter of, uh, of really convenience, I guess the, the, the whole Lord's Supper was divorced entirely from a meal and became a ceremony that you did in church. So now, for example, in many churches, you can go to church on Sunday and they have a, a, some piece of bread or a cracker or something like that and wine or grape juice. And you you simply eat the that cracker or piece of bread and that grape juice in that service. But you don't have a meal together. So it's important to understand the history and the historic flow, if you will, of how the Lord's Supper is developed, because if Christ, you know, Christians should not at all be embarrassed. In fact, it's actually our historic roots to stop in the middle of a meal that we're having and simply say, hey, let's take a second to remember the Lord's broken body and his shed blood, because that's that's the organic origin of the Lord's Supper. Now, the in in uh, it, when Jesus Christ was there. The Lord's Supper, if you will, the communion service, especially the shed blood, especially the shed blood, had to fulfill two purposes at once. And these two purposes are covered, uh, one of them in Matthew and Mark, and one of them in Luke. And unless we read the Bible with some background understanding and read it very carefully, we miss that completely, and we read Matthew and Mark and Luke as if they're saying the same thing, and they're not. Now, remember, to, to really understand what went on at the Last Supper, we have to remember about the blood covenant and, and what how it started and what it signified. So what I want to do, let's first go to Matthew. I want to read Matthew. I want to read Mark. I want to read Luke. We're going to talk about the differences, and then we're going to bring that back into the Old Testament, look at some of the historic background for the blood sacrifice, and then go to Jeremiah and look at the blood sacrifice in ratifying covenant. So in Matthew chapter 26, they're at the Last Supper, and verse 26 says, and while they were eating, and again, this is the organic origin of what we know is the Lord's Supper. It's they were simply eating a meal. And I'm sure this caught the disciples completely by surprise. They're just eating. <laughs> They're not expecting any kind of ceremony or anything. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had blessed it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Verse 27, and having taken the cup, having taken the cup and having given thanks, he gave it, he gave it the cup to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. So they're going to have to pass it around. Verse 28, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And that's what we need to see here. That in this case, in Matthew, the the uh, the cup, the wine represents Christ's blood which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And the reason for that is, and we'll go back into into the Old Testament and see this, when a person entered into a blood covenant, if you broke that blood covenant, then the penalty was death. Blood, if, if you broke a blood covenant, there had to be blood shed to pay for that broken blood covenant. So here's Jesus Christ. We know from from many scriptures that he was the sacrifice that paid for us. Why did he need to die to pay for us? Because the covenant started with a blood covenant, and the penalty for breaking the blood covenant was death. So here in Matthew, he says that this is the blood of the covenant, and why is it being poured out? Why am I dying? I'm dying for the forgiveness of sins. (laughs) 
you know, I'm, I'm dying because I want to die so that you can live. I mean, that's basically it. It's like him looking at me off the cross, looking at me in the face and saying, I'm hanging here. I'm going to die so that you, John, can live. Because that's really what it's about. It's about me having everlasting life, and he's willing to die in my place. And God had made a blood covenant with his people. They can go all the way back to Genesis when God killed the animals to clothe Adam and Eve. But more specifically, you can take it forward to the blood covenant that God made with the children of Israel, that they would be his people. And then we become uh, children of Abraham, according to Galatians 5.29 and other things. So we, so Christ and God entered into this blood covenant where God entered into this blood covenant with his people, and then we broke it. <laughs> Blind. You know, we broke it. So somebody had to die. And that's what Matthew emphasizes, and Mark emphasizes the same thing. So let's go to Mark. And in Mark, once again, we see the same thing. While they were eating, he took bread, Christ took bread, and when he had blessed it, he broke it and gave it to them and said, take it, this is my body, verse 23, and he took a cup, again, just a cup, the one they were using, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it, verse 20, 24, and he said to them, this is my blood, blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. And of course, you know, Christ died for the many. So this is this is one half of the reason for the blood covenant was the blood covenant was a if you broke it, you somebody had to die, and Christ died to pay for our sins as part of this blood covenant. Now let's go to Luke. And all of a sudden in Luke, we have a, a totally different angle. Because we know, I mean, I don't know about you guys, I'm pretty sure, though, that I know you well enough to know that you would not be particularly satisfied to live under the old covenant forever. <laughs> the old covenant with its, according to the rabbis, 613 laws and, and all of the stuff and, and Romans telling us that the old covenant couldn't make you righteous and all that stuff. We don't want to live under that old covenant. We want a new covenant. But here's the problem. How do you start a new covenant? You start a new covenant with a blood sacrifice. Well, what's available? <laughs> well, the only blood sacrifice that would suffice, certainly not the blood of a bull or a goat, the only blood sacrifice that will suffice is the blood sacrifice of Christ himself. So it was that Christ's death on the cross, and, and we know this and we talk about this all the time, we say that it was Christ's death on the cross and his shedding of blood that ratified and inaugurated the new covenant, that started the new covenant. And it and it did. So here's that's the emphasis in Luke. And so it says in verse uh, Luke chapter 22, verse 17, and he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. Again, they're going to pass it around. Verse 18, for I say to you, I will absolutely not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes which that also shows up in Matthew and Mark, which I get a kick out of because I think Christ, you know, is, is still waiting for the kingdom of God to come on earth. And uh, so he hasn't had any wine. So the next time you enjoy a glass of wine, think, well, you know, Christ to you, sir, because I know you're being patient and obedient to the word that you spoke at the last supper. So he says, um, and then uh, verse 19 and he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, when we're at a meal and we, we break bread, we can always stop and remember Christ. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Verse 20, and in the same way, he took the cup after he ate, after they ate, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. The new covenant is not mentioned in Matthew. It's not mentioned in Mark. What's mentioned in Matthew and Mark is that Christ had to die because of people breaking the old covenant. He had to die for the forgiveness of sins. That's the emphasis in Matthew and Mark. Here, the emphasis is not about dying to pay a penalty. The emphasis is about dying to be the inaugural sacrifice for a new covenant. We'll read about that in Jeremiah 31. See, both of these, both of these aspects 
are in the Old Testament. The, the death for someone that breaks uh, uh, the uh, blood covenant, it's covered in the, the sin offering of Leviticus chapter 4. It's covered in Isaiah chapter 53. The new covenant and the new covenant being cut between God and his people is in Jeremiah 31. So you have these two things. And so here we see the other half of in Luke, Luke chapter 20, he took the cup, 22 verse 20, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you, which is exactly right. It was poured out on our behalf so that the new covenant could be ratified. Now, interestingly enough, even a number of Bible translators don't understand this, and you have to be very careful when you're reading Matthew and Mark, because there are some English translations that stick the word new in Matthew and Mark, even though it's not there in any Greek text. And they stick it in because they say, well, yeah, yeah, but it is about the new covenant, right? No, it's not. Not in Matthew and Mark. In Luke, it's about the new covenant. Now, what makes this so unique with Christ and why it had to be Christ um, was because ordinarily the way it would work is here's the old covenant, blood covenant, and somebody breaks it. And what happens to them? They die. So they can't be around to make the next covenant because they're dead. <laughs> so God had to do something really new and unique here. The, the, because the death of Christ had to perform two very important yet completely unique functions. It had to pay for the sins of the people so that they could live forever. That's you and me. And it also had to inaugurate the new covenant. And that, that to my knowledge, there's no other way you can. This is the only, the only sacrifice ever in history where one death has been able to do both things because of God's purpose for Christ and what he did in Christ. And that becomes really super important. So let's go to the Old Testament. I want to show you some of this. Uh, particularly, I want to emphasis, uh, emphasize some of the uh, forgiveness of sins part with Abraham. Let's go to Genesis chapter 15. And we're going to take a look at the blood covenant in history. So we go back to Genesis. And so uh, in verse 7, God said, God's talking to Abraham, and God said to him, I am Yahweh, who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to possess it. So God says to Abraham, I'm going to give you this land. I, I love verse 8, and it reflects on the, the intimacy of the relationship between God and Abraham, because Abraham knew enough about the things of God that sometimes because of circumstances uh, some understood, some not understood. Things that he said would happen don't happen and vice versa. Um, and so he says, I'm going to give you this land. Verse 8, Abraham says, Lord Yahweh, how will I know that I will possess it? Well, that's a great question. Abraham's pressing into God. God, I want to be sure that I'm going to get this land. How can I know it? And of course, what God's going to do now is he's going to make a blood sacrifice He's going to make a blood covenant with Abraham to give Abraham the land. Here's the problem. God doesn't want Abraham to mess it up. <laughs> so, so God simply puts Abraham to sleep. He has Abraham set the whole thing up. Then he puts Abraham to sleep, and he goes through the pieces himself. So let's just read it really quick. So Abraham in verse 8, you know, God, how will I know that this is actually going to happen. God said to him, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram of three years, a turtle, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Verse 10, so he brought them all of these, cut them down the middle, and laid each half opposite the other, but he didn't divide the birds. Verse 11, the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. Now that tells you something about this, that God told Abraham he was going to do a blood sacrifice, a, a blood covenant. But, you know, so Abraham got it all set up, and then God didn't show. And Abraham saw all these birds of prey come as they smell the blood and stuff, and vultures, they're going to, they're going to eat on these, these uh, dead animals. And Abraham's driving him away, and he's kind of wondering in himself probably, well, God said he'd be here, so I'm sure he's coming. I just don't know when. 
And then it says, verse 12, as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, terror and great darkness fell on him. So Abram fell asleep. And it was while Abram was asleep that God spoke to him about, you know, his offspring living in a foreign land and going down to Egypt and that kind of thing. Verse 17, and when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch. And we know God is represented by, <clears throat> excuse me, by fire and by light. And we see that here. God represents himself in two completely different ways so that there's two witnesses to what's going on. A smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between the pieces. Verse 18, on that day, Yahweh cut a covenant with Abraham. Now, Abraham's asleep, but he'd already agreed to the covenant. But in any case, God is going to make sure I'm going to, I'm going to make this with myself so that human beings can't mess it up. So he cuts a covenant with Abraham saying, I've given this land to your offspring from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. And then he describes the, the people that are living there currently that are going to be displaced by Israel as they take the land that God gave them. After all, the whole earth is the Lord's and he can give it to whoever he wanted. And he decided to give it to Abram and his descendants. So this is, this is the blood covenant. And it was a way of making the blood covenant was to split animals in half and walk between the pieces. Now, if you study different cultures, there were different ways of making a blood covenant. Uh, there was this way where you cut animals and walk between the pieces. Uh, sometimes people would cut themselves, usually across the palm, and then clasp hands, and the blood would mix. Um, and that made a blood covenant. Sometimes there was a cut on the arm, a long cut on the arm made. Um, and the other person would make a long cut on their arm and the blood was somehow mixed, but it left a long scar. And then when the people would be walking around and, and people, other people would see that scar, they would know if I come against you, I'm coming against those people you made a blood covenant with. Because once you made a blood covenant with somebody, then you were you were obligated to protect them and be on their side, so to speak. Another way the blood covenant was made was people would cut themselves and both drip the, the blood into a goblet of wine, and then the wine was mixed, and the, and the blood wine was drunk by both, both parties. So there were different ways of making the blood covenant. This way of splitting an animal shows up here. Now, of course, we know Abraham didn't break this covenant. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 34. So in Jeremiah chapter 34, we see the same way of making a blood covenant but the people broke it in Jeremiah 34. Now, this is Zedekiah, King Zedekiah. He is the last king of Judah before uh, Judah was destroyed. The city burned, the temple burned to the ground. Zedekiah, uh, taken away, died in Babylon. So Zedekiah is the last sitting king uh, in Israel, um, or in Judah. Later on, uh, Jehoiachin, who'd been taken as an earlier king to Babylon, was allowed to rule as king, but not from his hometown, not from uh, Judea, but he, he reigned over his people from Babylon. So here in, in uh, 34, Jeremiah 34, we'll start in verse 8. The word that came to Jeremiah from Yahweh after King Zedekiah had cut a covenant with all the people who were at Jerusalem to proclaim liberty to them, because Jerusalem at that point was uh, under attack by the Babylonian army, they knew they needed God's help, and so they went to extreme measures to see if they could get right with God. And one of the ways they could get right with God was to allow their slaves to go free like you're supposed to. On the, after six full years of service, you're supposed to allow your, free, your slaves to go free, and they hadn't done it. So here they cut a covenant with the people, verse 9, that every man should let his male slave and his, his female slave uh, who is a Hebrew man or Hebrew woman free, no one should enslave a Jew, his brother. Verse 10, all the officials and all the people obeyed. Those who'd entered into this covenant, they obeyed and let them go. Verse 11, uh-oh. But afterwards, they turned around. These are, the, these are the wealthy, moneyed, powerful men in Judah that made this covenant to obey God, release their slaves, blood covenant. 
But afterwards, they turned around and forced the slaves and the slave girls to whom they had let go free to return and brought them into subjection as slaves, slaves and slave girls. And that really upset God, to say the least. Verse 12, therefore, the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah from Yahweh, saying, this is what Yahweh, the God of Israel, says. I cut a covenant with your fathers when I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And it goes on. Verse 15, you had recently uh, turned and done what is right in my eyes by each man proclaiming liberty to his neighbor, and you had cut a covenant before me in the house that's called by my name. So that blood covenant was actually cut inside the temple in Jerusalem. <clears throat> Verse 16, but you turned back and profaned my name, and every man forced his slave and his slave girl, you know, back into slavery. And Verse 17, therefore, this is what Yahweh says, you've not listened to me to proclaim liberty. And so he goes on, uh, so behold, I proclaim, remember the breaking the blood covenant is a death penalty. God says, so behold, in verse 17, I proclaim you a liberty, says Yahweh, to the sword, to the pestilence, to the famine, and I will make you to be tossed back and forth among all the kingdoms of the earth, verse 18. I will give the men who've transgressed my covenant, who have not performed the words of the covenant that they made before me when they cut the calf in two and passed between those parts. The officials of Judah, the officials of Jerusalem, the eunuchs, the priests, and all the people of the land who passed between the parts of the calf, saying basically making a blood covenant that they would release their slaves. Verse 20, I will give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their life, and their dead bodies will be for the food, will be food for the birds of the air and for the animals of the earth. And that's precisely what happened when the Babylonians attacked Jerusalem. So the penalty for breaking this blood covenant was death, and, and we need to, to really understand that. Um, so let's. what I'd like to do now is go to Leviticus chapter 4. Um, Leviticus chapter 4, and Leviticus chapter 4 is all about the sin offering. In verse 1, Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If anyone sins unintentionally in any of the things that Yahweh has commanded not to be done, and does any one of them, I like that, any one of them. You remember James says, if you break one commandment, you break the whole law. And here it's very, very uh, clearly, especially in the Hebrew text, which uses the word achad, the word one. You know, if you break one commandment, I'm sorry, you're toast. <laughs> <laughs> and that just, it just became, you know, and it's so many times people say, well, you know, I'm basically a good person. Well, God, you didn't make the rules. God made the rules. If you break one commandment, then as far as God's concerned, you might as well have broken them all. So now one of the things we learned from Leviticus 4 is depending on the position that you have in society, your sin can have a greater effect. Like, you know, if a if a leader sins, that sin has a greater effect than if just a common person sins. So here in Leviticus chapter four, when it comes to offering sin offerings, we see that the, the offering for sin, the sin offering itself shifts depending on the position you hold in society and, and how influential that uh, position is. So for example, in verse three, it says, if the anointed priest sins, so here's a priest, well, they were the top of the society, they represented God. So if they sin, then they have this big, huge offering they've got to offer. But something I, I want to uh, point out, verse three, it says, if the anointed priest sins, bringing guilt on all the people, then let him offer to Yahweh a young bull without blemish, as a sin offering for his sin that he has sinned. Now, the word sin offering here is interesting because in the Hebrew, it's shatach, and uh, it's the same word as sin. In, and we need to know, as, as Christians studying the Bible, we need to know that in both Greek and Hebrew, the word for sin is also the same word for sin offering. It's the same word. In English, there's two different words. We have sin, we have a sin offering. But in Hebrew, they have shatach. shatach. In, in Greek, they have harm, harmartia. And in both languages, 
those words are the same for sin and sin offering. So here it says that he's supposed to offer this sin offering for his sin that he has sinned. This is the priest, and it goes through his offering. Go down to verse 13. If the whole congregation of Israel sins, in other words, they're just all doing something wrong and are unaware of it, and they all sin, and then they read the law and go, my goodness, we've been sinning against God, then they have an offering they do together. In verse 22, when a leader sins, and now you have the sacrifice for leaders, but then you finally get down to verse 27, and if one person of the common people sins, by doing and they, sins unintentionally by doing one of the things. And again, the word one very specifically in the Hebrew text. If you do even one of the things that Yahweh has God has commanded not to be done and becomes guilty, if his sin with uh, with uh, bah, if his sin which he has sinned is made known, he's to bring his approach offering a goat. It's to be a female without blemish for his sin. <clears throat> Verse 20, he is to lay his hand on the head of the sin offering and kill the sin offering in the place of the burnt offering. The priest is to take some of the blood, put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering. The rest of the blood he's to pour out at the base of the altar. And then the fat uh, he burns to smoke on the altar. And then it says in verse 31, and the priest will make atonement for him and he will be forgiven. So here is the sin offering that the person has to do, and when he does it properly, then it says the priest makes atonement for him and he will be forgiven. And that becomes very important then. That's what's going on in Leviticus chapter 4. Now let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, if I was going to expand this a little bit, we go into Hebrews where we talk about the blood of bulls and goats can't really take away sin, has to be done every year and that kind of thing. So what was needed was a sacrifice that would one time for all cover for the sins of mankind. And then because it's mankind's breaking a blood covenant, it's got to mean death. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, last verse of the chapter, we read, he made him, this is God made Christ, who did not know sin. Christ never experienced sin. He never sinned in his life. Christ was a sinless human being, the only one who's ever lived. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made Christ, who did not know sin, to be a sin offering on our behalf. It's very important. Remember that in Greek, the Greek word harmartia, it can mean sin or sin offering, depending on the context. We saw the same word in Leviticus in the Septuagint text. We saw the same thing in Hebrew. It's very important that, uh, you know, there's so many versions that read, uh, they made him who did not know sin to be sin. Christ didn't become sin. He didn't become a sinner. He became the, the type in the Old Testament was the sin offering that would die. And the antitype is Christ himself, who was the sin offering. And that's exactly the way the Greek text should be translated. God made Christ, who did not know sin, to be a sin offering. Why? On our behalf. Why couldn't we be our own sin offering? Because <laughs> then you're dead. <laughs> you know, that's, by the way, that's an interesting thing that people don't really realize that, you know, because we talk all the time about Christ paying for our sin. You know, you can pay for your own sin. There, lots of people are going to pay for their own sin. The, the only problem with that is the wages of sin is death. So you pay for your own sin and you're dead. So what, what good does that do you? You need to have somebody else be able to pay for your sin. And that's why God had to, had to set this up so that he could make Christ a sin offering on our behalf, verse uh, 521, so that through union with him, we would become the righteousness of God that we, we, we get that imputed righteousness because we believe in Christ. We brought Christ to the altar, so to speak, the cross. Christ was killed in our place on our behalf. We got his righteousness. He got our sin. He died for our sin. That was the punishment we deserved. Did the Old Testament foretell this? Well, yeah, one way it foretold this was in typology. We've already seen the sin offering. The person brings 
an animal without blemish. The animal is actually, and he kills the animal. A lot of people don't read that closely enough. But if you notice, you go back to Leviticus, the first four or five chapters, when it's talking about the offerings, the burnt offering, the sin offering, the, it's the person who brings the offering who kills it. So they realize it's, it's my sin that killed this animal. They bring the animal, they kill the animal, the priest catches the blood. So we have, how do we know Christ was a sin offering? We have the typology of the Old Testament, but let's go to Isaiah 53. In Isaiah chapter 53, of course, this is the great chapter about Christ's substitution for us and what Christ endured and that kind of thing. So here in Isaiah chapter 53, Let's see, where to get off to? Yeah, verse 5. Okay. Isaiah 53, 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions, was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment, that's the punishment that you and I deserved. The punishment that brought us shalom, peace, well-being, was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. I mean, it's such an amazing verse. God set this whole thing up so that the punishment that you and I deserved would would be on Christ. And what we would get was we would get the the, the shalom, the well-being of the sinless one who was Christ who died in our place. And then we make it make sure that you know in Isaiah 53 he's going to die because verse 9 says they made his grave with the wicked but with a rich man in his death. And that's, of course, because he was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, who was a rich man. So Isaiah foretold not only that Christ would die, but he would bear the punishment and we would get the shalom, the well-being. It doesn't hardly seem fair, but that's the way God set it up so that God could have a family to be with him. So that is Matthew and Mark. That's what Matthew and Mark are portraying that Jesus Christ was the blood sacrifice, as Matthew very clearly says, for the forgiveness of many. So that's Matthew. Now we go to Luke. Luke's going to portray the other half of the, of the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Let's go back and read it one more time in Luke chapter 22. And in Luke chapter 22, Christ says in verse 20, in the same way, he took the cup after the eight, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for, for you. It is the new covenant. So now to find out more about the new covenant, we've got to go back into the Old Testament and read about the new covenant. So let's go to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 30, 31, and we, by the time of Jeremiah, the, the failure of the Old Testament to be able to make people right, righteous was uh, very clear, was Jer during Jeremiah's ministry that Nebuchadnezzar attacked, uh, killed the people, burned the city to the ground, burned the temple to the ground, carried a lot of people in captive to Babylon. Uh, so that all occurred during Jeremiah's time. So the failure of the Old Covenant to make people righteous in God's sight was was pretty clear in Jeremiah's time. And so in verse 31, Jeremiah 31, 31, behold, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, that I will cut a new covenant with the house of Israel. The Hebrew word is literally cut. Um, it gets idiomatically translated as made. Um, and there are times when the word cut is used for covenants that were not literally cut by blood covenant. But in this particular case, in Jeremiah 31, the, the words are literally cut the covenant. Um, and of course, we know the new covenant was a, bl a blood covenant. It was a covenant in Christ's blood. So Jeremiah 31, 31, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, that I will cut a new covenant with the house of Israel and will house of Judah. Verse 32, not like the covenant I cut with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of Egypt. That's the old covenant. And that covenant was cut in Exodus chapter 24, verses 3 to 8. And that's when that covenant was cut. So he says, not like the old covenant, my covenant that they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares Yahweh. Verse 33, but this is the covenant that I will cut with the house of Israel after those days, declare Yahweh. I will put my law within them. Yes, I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God 
and they will be my people. This becomes very, very important in light of history, because when we look at Ezekiel's temple and the temple that will be in the millennial kingdom when Christ reigns on earth, and we're all there as part of the new covenant, um, there's, there's a temple, but there's no Ark of the Covenant with the commandments in it. In the Old Testament, God, you know, the people were hard-hearted. <laughs> the people were hard-hearted, and God wrote the commandments on a tablet of stone, the heart of the law anyway, the Ten Commandments. He wrote them on tablets of stone, and then they put those tablets in the Ark of the Covenant. Well, now in the New Covenant, God's not going to write the laws out there somewhere on, on some stone tablet. He's going to write the laws in here on people's hearts. So he doesn't need an Ark of the Covenant to contain the law. Each and every one of us will be the tablet on which God's laws are written. So it specifically says in Jeremiah, there's no Ark of the Covenant in the Millennial Temple, which is, is pretty cool. He says, I'm going to put my law within them. What, you know, that'll be just such a, I mean, it's already started for us Christians, but it, uh, but it'll be there in, in much more fullness when we will know like we are known as 1 Corinthians 13 promises. And, and he, he finishes uh, 33, I will be their God, they will be my people, verse 34, and they will no longer teach each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, know Yahweh, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, says Yahweh, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. And this is exactly true, and that's what's coming. And I'll tell you, you know, if, if you're a theologian or a Bible teacher, to, to think about a time in which theological squabbling will come to an end, that's a great promise. There's almost no point of doctrine on which theologians won't squabble and argue. <laughs> and, and that can be, it, it, it's, 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 it's used to be fun when I was younger. Now it's, it, I just hate it. I wish everybody knew God clearly. And here's this promise that we're all going to know God clearly. So this, this is the new covenant in Jeremiah chapter 31. That's what's coming. And the law is going to be on our hearts. First Corinthians 13 says that, that we're going to know, even as we are known, the law and the law of Moses, I mean, the, the Old Testament law said that everybody would know God. And we know from uh, books like Hosea that the law will go forth from Jerusalem and Christ will rule and that kind of thing. So now when we read Matthew and Mark and Luke, we get a fullness of what's going on when Christ held up the cup. Um, by the way, the cup that the cup that I'm going to use, I thought I thought about, you know, what cup am I going to use to hold the, the wine that represents God's, you know, the, the blood of Christ, that God's covenant blood? What cup am I going to use? And I thought the, the most common cup that I use in my life is a coffee cup. I get up in the morning, I have a coffee cup of coffee. I ha have one at work. You may have even seen me, you know, drinking out of my coffee while I'm I'm sitting here. And I usually have a cup of coffee around lunchtime and sometimes into the afternoon. So I brought a coffee cup. But I, I just, you know, what in in holding up this cup of blood, you know, it's it's just That Christ would die for me is so humbling. And that he would, and, and God would set it up that through his death, there would be a new covenant so that, so that we can walk more perfectly, so that we know God brilliantly and clearly. I mean, these things are just so incredibly powerful that it's just a great truth that, that we can, we can um, put ourselves into. Um, and I, then I think the the one thing that I really do need to cover, um, let me look at the time. Yeah, let's go to 1 Corinthians. I wasn't going to cover this, but I, I feel like we really should. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Because if we understand the, the truth of what the, the broken body and shed blood represented, they represented sacrifice. You know, Christ, right after the Last Supper, immediately after the Last Supper, they went into the Garden of Gethsemane. And, and what did Christ say? Did Christ look up at his father and pray and say, God, I'm proud to die for all these people? He prayed and he said, God, if there's any other way than this. 
And of course he said, but nevertheless, not what I want, but what you want. But it became clear what Christ wanted. He didn't want to be tortured. He didn't want to die. He, he wanted to see if there was some other way. And I, it's just, it's this whole Last Supper is about sacrifice. It's about not getting your way, not doing what you want, not, you know, always drawing a line in the sand. Well, this is what I want and that kind of thing. That it's about seeing the whole body of Christ and sharing with others. And here in 1 Corinthians 11, what was what was going on? They, they were doing they were getting together and they were having the Lord's Supper, but they they didn't get the heart of it at all. And we'll see that if we look at 1 Corinthians 11, 17. But in giving you this instruction, Paul writes, I do not praise you because you do not, because you meet together, but it results in more harm than good. Uh, the NIV translation is, is idiomatic, but very good. He says, your meetings do more harm than good. And, and that was going on. And why were their meetings do, doing more harm than good? Because they were fostering division instead of unity. Because the people weren't taking care of each other. He says, verse 18, for first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you. Well, yeah, no kidding. And then verse 19, there, for there must also be factions so that the approved ones become recognized. See the division here in the text? So verse 20 says, so when you assemble together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. In the Lord's Supper, it was communal. They shared, they understood, they supported each other. He said, that's not what you guys are doing. Verse 21, for when you eat, each one goes ahead with his own supper first. And one is hungry and another's drunk. He said, you guys get there. And the people of you that have money, you show up with all this food and you eat it yourself. And then people that are slaves, maybe, and they just barely made it because their master let them come to the meeting. They may show up with nothing. The master didn't give them much of anything, maybe a piece of bread or something to eat. You know, and so the, the wealthy, you know, money people here should be sharing He should have gotten the heart of Christ's sacrifice. He broke his body for us. He shed his blood for us. It's not hard to visualize and see what's going on here. And that people would show up with food and other people would show up hungry and they wouldn't share their food. You, you understand how hard-hearted that is? How it misses the sacrifice of Christ? It misses the whole communion situation? No wonder Paul writes and says, your meetings do more harm than good. Sadly, that's still going on in the church today. There are church meetings out there going on that do more harm than good. That's not what we want to do. We, we want to be in part of a, a church that really builds people up in unity. And in verse 22, he reproves them. He says, you know what? Don't you have houses to eat and drink in? You know, if you're going to behave like that, eat and drink at home. Do you show contempt for the church of God? Put to shame those who have nothing, which is how they would feel. They're, they're sitting there in the meeting with nothing to eat, but maybe a piece of bread and you're over there feasting yourself. What should I say to you? Should I praise you in this? I praise you not. And then and then what he says, um, and I, I think that, that uh, um, he says, you know, verse 30, without doing a whole teaching on this section, if we go down to verse 30, he says, for this, for this cause, many among you are weak and sick and many sleep in death. In other words, you guys aren't taking care of each other. You know, you aren't making sure each, each, everybody has nutrition, has food, has something good to drink, you know, so you're not taking care of each other. And so some of you are weak and sick and some, some among us have even died. And that's something we want to do here. This is what the Lord's Supper is all about. It's about being sacrificial and making sure that, that the, the whole body of Christ is taken care of. So once we understand that, we are we are in a position to take communion. So I want to go back to Matthew. And in Matthew chapter 22, 26 again, it says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had blessed it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples saying, take, eat. This is my body. And I'd like uh, you to grab, get your piece of bread out that you have. and. Father, I thank God for these people here at this in this meeting, and I thank God for all those who will hear this teaching, and I thank God for all of our brothers and sisters in Christ, and I thank God that you're going to set up divine appointments so that those of us who are Christians 
can can run meet run into hap, happenstance to get with people who aren't Christians and be able to spread the gospel to them and tell them about the gospel and Christ we really understand that you did give your body and father we understand that you did give your son so father in the name of Jesus Christ I bless this bread that's a symbol of your broken body and may we walk in your footsteps and be willing to be sacrificial to help others with the great news and the material things that we have. So please uh, partake of the bread. And Matthew goes on to say, verse 27, and having taken the cup and having given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And Father, I bless the cup also. I bless this, this drink that we drink in your name and to your honor that so represents what you did for us, even though we know that you didn't want to die but you did it because it was the will of God. Father and Lord Jesus, help us to see what the will of God is for our lives and that we could walk into that will powerfully and willingly and that you would help us and give us great strength. Father, that we would not pray for our life to be easy, but we would pray for the strength to go through life with honor and glory to you, no matter what that took. And I pray for this and ask your blessing in Christ's name. God bless you. Please partake of, of what representation of the blood. Well, I can't thank you guys enough for being here to do, do this together as a group. A tremendous, tremendous blessing to me, incredibly meaningful. And I trust it has been for you. And Father and Lord Jesus, can't thank you enough for all that you do for us. We dedicate ourselves to you like Christ. You dedicated yourself to your Father. We bless you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for being here.